Hey guys, it's Jill. Jen and I wanted to give you a heads up about the content on today's episode. It may be triggering for more sensitive audiences. Refer to the show notes for more specifics and take care while you listen. On this episode of Common Mystics, we discuss the mysterious circumstances surrounding the death of Tom Hepburn, the elder brother of the Hollywood icon, Katherine Hepburn. I'm Jennifer James. I'm Jill Stanley. We're psychics. We're sisters. We are Common Mystics. We find extraordinary stories in ordinary places. But today's story takes us to Hartford, Connecticut. I'm... Super excited. Tell me why. Because first of all, I love Kate. I know I love Kate too. I love her so much. She is an icon, like legit. She's like the goat, the greatest of all time. You know it. (laughs) And this story just popped out to us why we were en route to New England. And it's fascinating the way it all just came together to make this story happen. Yeah, like, well, truly. tell us. Remind us how that happened. Because it was pretty uh, like serendipitous that we are even talking about Katherine Hepburn. So start. Well, like, uh, Okay, 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 okay. So we should note that this is a more voices from the road. It so, is. So you know what we do. They know what we do. They know what we, we dra- do right now. They know what we do. We travel around the country, and we are led by the spirits to a verifiable story previously unknown to us that give voice to the voiceless. However, sometimes in our travels and our research, we find a voice that we can't shake off. And Mm. that's why, I know, right? They just stay with us. And such is the case of one Thomas Hepburn. But, so this is what happened. Jen and I are going on probably the best road trip of my life to New England. Like, for real. It was so special. So fun. I love New England. Love it, love it, love it. We were still in Pennsylvania, and it was our first night on the road. And I was like, Jennifer, did you see the Netflix documentary, Call Me Kate, about Katherine Hepburn? And she was like, no. And I'm like, oh my God, you're going to love it so much. We're we're playing it right now. Mm -hmm. So cue the wine. Netflix, we were watching it. We watched it. And we found out that she had an older brother in that series. Mm-hmm. And we were we were like, oh, okay. So we knew a little bit about him. And right. then we so happened to know that we were passing through the city where her and her family were buried. So we we're like, we're definitely going to stop there. Right. Coincidentally, we were not planning to, to see the graves, but our route just happened to put us right in the right place at the right time so that we knew we'd be able to visit the graves. And so we were super excited that it happened that way. Can you even believe it? Okay, so Q, we're in the car, we're headed east, we're going to Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Tell me. Well, we arrived at the cemetery, Cedar Hill Cemetery. So we had looked it up in advance. We, we, we found out where they were buried, and we, we go to Cedar Hill Cemetery. But it is huge. It is a huge modern cemetery. And according to cedarhillcemetery.org, it encompasses 270 acres and includes over 35,000 graves. And we didn't know where they were. Mm-mm. We didn't know where they were. Well, so, I will tell you, this was like a park-like atmosphere. There are winding roads. There are hills and, and ponds. So unlike the best day, even if we did have any clue where they were, it would still be difficult to find them, right? True. Right. Yeah. Just because of the, how sprawling and how windy the roads were right, in the cemetery. So you drive in and immediately we see the size and we're like, oh man, why don't we pull over and park and just walk around and try to get our bearings, right? Because that's what we usually do when we go to any cemetery. True. So you pull over on the side of one of those cemetery paths. Do you know what I mean? Like the small mm-hmm. roads. You pull over. We both get out of the car and we see half obstructed by trees and shrubs right across the road where you had pulled the car up. We see the Hepburn name engraved on a stone, on a large stone. Spirit led us right there. There's like, no, literally? no question. Like, we got out of the car, I turned around, and there's this big-ass stone that says Hepburn. And I was like, get out of here. Exactly. Exactly. But the graves, I have to say this, they were much more modest than I thought. 
Kath- well, Kate, she is so classy, Jennifer. Yeah. She's super classy. Tell us about it. Well, I mean, even though, I mean, we will find out, we're going to talk in the next few minutes about the prestige that the Hepburn family had even prior to Catherine being a big name in Hollywood. And yet it was it was just a large stone. It, it wasn't a huge obelisk. It was nothing showy. It was just a stone. It said Hepburn. It was surrounded by trees and shrubs. And then all of the family, including Kate, just had a little rectangular stone flush with the ground, the same as our family. The same Mm -hmm. as grandma and mom and and all of our people. So it was not showy at all. The one thing that did maybe indicate that she was special in some way or famous in some way was that people had left certain mementos at Mm -hmm. Catherine's stone, like golf balls, lipsticks. Perfume. Mm -hmm, Perfume. So that was kind of cute. Other than that, you, you wouldn't know that a famous Hollywood icon was buried there. Amazing. And mm-hmm. we were totally feeling the vibes. But as we were standing there, in particular, you were, I would say, overcome with emotion. Can you describe what you were feeling and what was happening in that moment? As much as I am a huge fan of Katherine Hepburn's, I was particularly pulled to her brother, Thomas. And I felt a real sadness surrounding Thomas in particular, and and also for the entire family, because the situation with Thomas, it was sad for him, but it was sad for the whole family. And that was the overwhelming feeling that I had standing at the gravesite. What would you say? While I was standing there, I was feeling overcome with sadness, but also confusion mm. by the situation. And I just didn't understand what was happening, like what was the family dynamic and what had happened within this family. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Well, let's, we're going to get into the family in a few minutes, but let's first talk about Catherine because she was the, the one individual in the family that I did have some familiarity with prior to this, prior to this trip. I just want to say this. If If our younger listeners, and there are younger listeners out there, Mm -hmm. who have not heard of or have not seen any of the works that Katherine Hepburn did, just know that her vibe was a pioneering feminist icon. She, there were rumors about her sexuality because of the way she dressed and her friendships that she had. She made choices for herself and not for the industry. So please, besides that and just who she was as a person, please let's dive into her early life, her movies. Tell me everything. I cannot get enough of it. Okay, so Katherine Hepburn was an actress widely regarded as one of the greatest actresses in the history of Hollywood. Her career spanned more than six decades, people, 60 years. It's insane. She holds the record still to this day for Best Actress Oscars. She was nominated for 12 and she won four. One for a movie called Morning Glory from 1933. One for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner from 1967. One for The Lion in Winter, 1968. That was a good one. It's, even though it doesn't sound good, her comic delivery in that movie is everything. Continue, sorry. In 1968, her Oscar was a tie with Barbara Streisand for Funny Girl. So just an aside. It still counts. It still, still counts. Ca- still counts. And then her last and fourth Oscar was for On Golden Pond in 1981. Wow, that span. The first Oscar, 1933, her last in 1981. That's incredible. And still producing good work. So Hepburn's career was marked by a series of groundbreaking performances that showcased her range as an actress, clearly, but also helped redefine the roles available to women, period. Hepburn challenged traditional expectations of women in Hollywood and beyond, and she was known for her independent spirit and her refusal to conform to the expectations of the studio system, which made her a role model for generations of women. Including these two women right here. (laughs) Yeah. 
For sure. Katherine Hepburn had a scrappy, independent spirit throughout her life and career. And there are a lot of examples that highlight this fierce independence and distinctive character. Would you like to discuss some? Oh my God, I was so excited. So let's talk about her fashion sense. Very important. Yes, please. Katherine Hepburn defied the traditional expectations of women's fashion in Hollywood by frequently wearing pants. She wore trousers at a time when it was considered unconventional and even, in some cases, criminal to wear pants. Okay, I want to say today what is in vogue right now in fashion is the high-waisted, wide leg trouser Mm -hmm. that you're welcome, came from (laughs) Katherine Hepburn. Not just Katherine. There are other actresses that were early on wearing slacks, but she was a big name. She was a big name, and she pioneered the look, and we're still rocking it today. Continue. So, yeah, no, it was criminal in some places. There was a teacher, for instance. Her name was Helen Hulick, and she was imprisoned in Los Angeles in 1938 for wearing pants to court. She made a court appearance in pants and was arrested. Now, Katherine Hepburn was never arrested, but she did encounter discrimination for donning pants, like the time she was directed to use the staff entrance at the Claridge Hotel in London. And even so, she refused to change. Instead, she just entered through the staff door. Super classy. Can I just tell you something that I just posted on Facebook? Yes, tell me everything. Okay, so Katherine Hepburn in, like, the 80s, the, like, old, like, is having this this moment with Barbara Walters, and she's being interviewed, like, on TV, on, like, a morning show. But if you know anything about Katherine Hepburn, she's, like, in slacks. She looks like an artist. She's wearing, like, a button-down, t- like, shirt with, like, a turtleneck underneath, and she's, like, slouching in the chair. Like, literally, like, laid back, feet up on, like, a table next to Barbara Walters. Mm-hmm. And Barbara so cool. is, like, leaning back. That's so cool. Like, she had zero fucks, right? Mm -hmm. So just looking at that image of, like, Catherine Hepburn just, like, relaxing and having a conversation, and then Barbara Walters, like, all intense, like, leaning forward and leaning into it was pretty interesting in itself. But this is what I wanted to say. What the clip starts at is where Catherine Hepburn says, I lived my life as a man. I had enough money to make my own choices and I was fearless. And that is such a powerful sentence. It gives me goosebumps even to like ab lib it right now. In response to that sentence, Barbara Walters says to her, is that why you you never wear a skirt? Because because you you want to be treated like a man. And Catherine's like, I have a skirt. And she's like, oh, you do? You have a skirt? And she's like, yes, I have a skirt. She's like, one, one skirt? And Catherine Hepburn says, yes, I have one skirt. And Barbara goes, well, why don't you wear it? And she goes, how about this? How about I wear it to your funeral? Oh. Damn. Damn. (laughs) Salty. 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 And you're just like, bam. Mm. Seriously, Barbara? Seriously? Oh, my gosh. That's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for Barbara Walters right there. But Mike dropped like a motherfucker. And you know what? She didn't even sit straight up when she said it. She was still laid back. She was like, (laughs) I'll wear it to your funeral. (laughs) (laughs) So something that a lot of modern people don't understand or don't know about Katherine Hepburn is that she was actually labeled box office poison in the late 1930s. Because I'm just saying that 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 moniker that that trope that they're putting on women happened a lot. Like this is not the first actress in the 30s. Box office poison. Yeah, and it's like fuck you, really. <laughs> okay, go on. And that's sorry. because she had a series of failures. She had a series of movies that were not hits, right? Well, her confidence, regardless of that, did not show at all in any future performances. Continue. No. In fact, she didn't let it bother her. She she didn't let the setback end her career. And a lot of women, a lot of people in this position would have just given up. But she took an unprecedented step by buying the film rights to a movie, to a play, actually, called The Philadelphia Story which she ended up creating into a film and starring in. And it was a huge success and it revitalized her career and demonstrated her resilience and her ability to bounce back from adversity. 
Okay, stop right now. This is a movie that you can watch today and still enjoy for so many reasons. She not only bought the rights to this play, but she asked all her friends in the industry to star in it with her. So what you're watching is this ensemble cast of real friends having fun on screen. And in the beginning of the film, Cary Grant, who, by the way, hot as fuck, is like her love interest in the movie. But the first scene is him walking out in like a huff and a puff. And then he turns around and she's standing there with her arms crossed and he puts his hand on her face and pushes her down. And the reason why that is so meaningful is because she was such a strong woman, a woman so many men wanted to put her in her place. Mm. So it set the tone for the movie. Like, you can relax. We already knocked her down a peg, Mm -hmm. right? Right. It was a brilliant way to start the movie, for sure. But I think one of the lessons here is that she was part of the old studio system where she was paid by the studio and she had to be in the films that they gave her. And the range for actresses was pretty narrow, right? There are Mm -hmm. only very few roles, types of roles that women were able to play, right? Right. The the slut, you know, the the mother, right? I mean, there are very Mm. few archetypes. The sister, the girl next door. Right. So for her to just buy a story and do it her way, that was unprecedented. And then you see that, that she was creating, she took control of her career and was creating these stronger roles for women, these independent characters. She also had a very unconventional personal life in terms of her love life. She never got married. She was fiercely private. And she did have a long-term relationship with an actor named Spencer Tracy. And it lasted 26 years until his death. Now, it was kept out of the public eye, or they tried to keep their romance out of the public eye, because Spencer Tracy happened to be married. I will say this. It's very classy for a couple reasons. One, she was never kissing and telling. And that reminds me of Anne Margaret and Elvis Presley, when Anne Margaret, even after he died, would not talk about it. Mm -hmm. Then number two, when Spencer's funeral was going on, Catherine didn't go out of respect for his marriage and his wife. Right. That's that is classy AF. For sure. For sure. And also her activism and her opinions were unique in Hollywood. So she was raised in a very liberal household and exposed to very progressive ideas from a young age. For instance, she accompanied her mother to suffragist demonstrations where they would promote voting for women as a very young girl. So she came to Hollywood with these very progressive opinions and they translated into her work in film. So let's take a step back because I'm really intrigued about her early life and her family life. Because let's do it. It seems like it's idyllic. It does. So Catherine Houghton Hepburn was born on May 12, 1907 in Hartford, Connecticut, into a family with a rich legacy of social activism and intellectualism. Now, Catherine was the second of six children in the Hepburn family. Okay. Her older brother was Thomas Hepburn Jr. Tom, we'll call him. He and Catherine were very close. Thomas was Catherine's beloved brother with whom she shared a very deep bond. Then after him, of course, came Catherine. And then after her, two brothers, Richard and Robert, and then two sisters, Marion and Margaret. So growing up in New England, Catherine and her brothers were always in the ocean, having fun, frolicking. She cut her hair short and she was just like one of the guys. That Mm -hmm. was what she did. And her best friend in the whole world was her older brother, Thomas. And they were like thick as thieves. These two would get in trouble. Yes, Mm -hmm. they did. Mm -hmm. And the family was well-to-do. They were progressive and they were socially minded. And the children were all brought up in an atmosphere of this social activism and intellectual pursuits. And they were raised to exercise their freedom of speech. And they were also encouraged to think about and to debate any topic they wanted. That is so crazy to Mm -hmm. think at that time, like the early 1900s, to have that kind of upbringing. It really was. It was special. And it was special because of their parents. 
Pretty cool. Tell me a little bit about their parents. So their mother was Catherine Martha Houghton, and she was, as I noted, a suffragist and also an advocate for women's rights. Love it. Their father was Dr. Thomas Hepburn, and he was a very respected man. He was a urologist. A urologist is a doctor who specializes in the urinary system. But he also contributed significantly to public health initiatives, specifically in the realm of sexual health education. Wow. I know. That's so progressive. So progressive. You got it. So both parents were activists for social change in the United States. Dr. Thomas Hepburn contributed to founding the New England Social Hygiene Association, which aimed to educate the public about venereal disease, so about sexually transmitted diseases. We have a lot to thank Dr. Hepburn for, apparently. For sure. who knew? Right. And Catherine, the mother, led the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association and later advocated for birth control alongside Margaret Sanger. Love it. This is amazing. That's incredible. We need more of you today. (laughs) So the Hepburn family was very well known in their community, and they were largely respected. But I want to note that Catherine's parents faced community criticism for their progressive beliefs because not everybody's political views aligned with the very vocal Dr. Thomas Hepburn and his wife, Catherine. I can see that. Mm -hmm. And it makes me have more respect for these people knowing that not only were they pioneering in their fields that interest them, Mm -hmm. like the suffragette movement and Dr. Hepburn's medical pursuits, but also to know that people were like, oh my, and pushing back against them makes it more, like so much more meaningful to me. For sure. Yeah. Because they were swimming upstream. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're going against the current. Okay. So you have this influential family in the forefront of these progressive social ideas in the community, leading the organizations for women's rights, for women's reproductive health, for education about sexual health. Not only that, but people love to hate them because of those efforts, right? Right. So people love to hate that they're rich, they're powerful, and people are like, fuck those people. So they're just looking for reasons to talk shit about them. You know the type. And so- This is the context in which this highly public family would be thrust into an unspeakable tragedy. Uh Uh-oh. You just popped my head. I know. I know. What is happening? Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. But I do want to say this is where I want to refer to that trigger warning at the beginning of this episode because the following does contain some sensitive information. Now, according to news sources... 13-year-old Catherine and her 15-year-old brother, Tom, were enjoying Easter break at their godmother's house, Mary Towell, and she lived in Greenwich Village, New York. And Catherine and Tom were away from their parents and their four other siblings. So this was a really special fun time. Yes. And Tom got his own room. While he was staying with Mary Towell, he had his own room on the third floor of the house. And it was old-fashioned in a way that just delighted him. And it had the sloping roof with the naked, rustic rafters in the ceiling. And he just loved it. I mean, think about just being in Greenwich Village, New York at the time, and in this old home with the exposed beams in the attic space would have been so much scope for the imagination. Mm. I understand. Like, just thinking about it gets me excited. What a wonderful time. Now, their relatives took Tom and Catherine all around New York City, and they went up to the top of the tower of the Woolworth Building. And they saw a film called A Yankee in the Court of King Arthur, based on the book by Mark Twain. Now, the siblings delighted in seeing the story brought to life on the screen because their own home in Connecticut was just a short distance from Mark Twain's home where he wrote that story. And so they had some background information about Mark Twain. And they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, we kind of know him. But 
Catherine did report that there was a scary moment in that film when Tom got the, quote, horrors. And that was a scene when there were hangings depicted. Mm. But according to her, he soon appeared to snap out of it, recover, and he still had a fine time in the city. Now, on the evening of April 1st, Catherine and Tom were preparing to return home from their visit. They had had a wonderful week or so with their relatives, and they had already packed up their suitcases that night, and they were anticipating getting up in the morning and heading home on the train. But before they left that night, friends and family gathered together, and Tom and Catherine were both in high spirits, and Tom even played several songs on his banjo for the crowd. I love it. So he was entertaining. Now, the siblings retired around 10 p.m. The next morning at 9 o'clock, following breakfast, 13-year-old Catherine was tasked with waking her brother up to make sure that they didn't miss their train to Connecticut. So running up to the attic bedroom where Tom was staying, she knocked on the door, but there was no response. And so she yelled out to him, sleepyhead, but there was only silence. She tried to open the door, but it was locked. And so she called for Mary. And together they opened the door and found the body of Tom. Mm -hmm. He had climbed up on his suitcase and hanged himself from a rafter overhead by a rope knotted together from bed sheets. According to a doctor who was called to the scene, Tom had been dead for approximately five hours. That is had to be horrible. Not I can't only, even, I can't even imagine. I mean, I can't, I especially can't imagine for Catherine, but even Mary, like these kids were in her care <sighs> and having that happen, just, it's heartbreaking on so many levels. So the local media were immediately printing information about this event, because remember, this is a notable family. Yeah. A family people love to hate. So the Hartford Courant reported that Tom committed suicide in, quote, a moment of morbid depression. And the medical examiner declared, according to that source, that the boy had, quote, a nervous disposition. And the New York Herald reported that he was a, quote, nervous, high-strung boy, and the trip was intended to divert him as much as possible. Wow. Yeah. Now, the exact details surrounding Tom's death remained somewhat unclear, and this is because there was a lack of information, and that has led to various interpretations over the years, and some sources do suggest that it might have just been an accident rather than a deliberate act of suicide. Okay, I don't see how that can be as from the description that you painted for us, but Mm. continue. Well, I think the question is, before this event, had Thomas shown any signs of of a mental health crisis, right? Were there signs before this day that he was maybe struggling with his mental health? I think that's a great question. Were there? Well, I found some information in the papers at the time about Tom. And we know, of course, that he was the eldest of the six Hepburn children. And he had been described by people who knew him as bright and healthy and attractive, athletic, and good at all his studies at school. He was also Mm. really popular with his classmates. He played football and baseball, and he was involved in extracurriculars as well. He was a member of the York Club at his Kingswood School, and he was also on staff of the school paper. I mean, seriously, is there anything this kid... He sounds like the model student, the model 15-year-old. I can't even. Well, he sounds like the model firstborn Mm, and namesake, right? Mm -hmm. His family talked about him too. They said that he had, quote, not a care in the world and seemed happy and lively and cheerful and always in the best of spirits. And the papers reported that Dr. Hepburn planned for Tom to go to Yale and to study medicine at Johns Hopkins, where he himself had graduated years before. Well, it sounds like to me that there aren't any straight-out indicators 
that would lead Tom to commit suicide, but continue. Well, I did find one thing that was written in the papers, and this was that Tom was a sufferer of something called St. Vitus's Dance. What in the hell? I know. St. Vitus's Dance is known as a different name today. What is it? Sydenham Korea. Korea? I'm not even sure how to say it. Sydenham Korea, which is a neurological disorder characterized by irregular and involuntary movements of muscle groups. So basically, like the shakes. Mm-hmm. Or like a twitch, is it? Twitches, shakes, maybe seizure-like activity. And okay. these shakes occur in various parts of the body, and it follows having a strep infection. And the name St. Vitus's Dance is derived from the late Middle Ages when people with the disease attended the chapels of St. Vitus, who was believed to have curative powers over the disease. So that's how it got that name. But it's basically a manifestation of the strep infection. I mean, do we know how often these tics or these episodes would last? Is it like constant? Is it, I mean, what do we know about his condition? Well, we don't, if anything, we don't know anything specifically about his condition per se. We don't have his medical reports. Well, whatever it was, it hadn't stopped him from being the ideal student. Like he was involved in so many extracurricular activities. We know he was an active boy from his time in the ocean with Catherine that she's so lovingly describes in the documentary. Right. So he he seemed pretty healthy. He does. Some of the symptoms, though, of this particular ailment, um, and it can range from very, very mild to very, very incapacitating, right? So there's a huge, huge range of how seriously it can affect a person. But it is indicated here that irritability, anxiety, and emotional instability can be symptoms of this disease. And I think that's why they were reporting on it after his suicide, that this maybe was one of the reasons that he had done this to himself, that he had committed this suicide. I get it. But there's still more. not anyone's Go ahead. still not anyone's business, but whatevs. Mm-hmm. But there was one significant event in his young life that has been documented. Okay, tell me. About a year before his death, his parents discovered Tom with a noose around his neck at the family house. It was an alarming incident for sure, but Tom, who was 14 years old at the time, insisted that he was just playing a stunt, that he was just playing around and it didn't mean anything and he wasn't trying to hurt himself. That's what the story says. Of course, though, this might have been a sign that Tom was grappling with some mental health challenges. So I have some thoughts on this. Okay. I have a friend whose son committed suicide oh. in this the same a similar circumstance. And part of when I was reading for her felt like this is something that he tried again and again, but like didn't go through with it. Does that make sense? So it was like this something that it was like, let's see how long I can do this for before. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying one way or another, but it's just to me from that, those kinds of readings and that experience, I'm not a medical professional at all and do not listen to me on any advice ever, but it does seem like when someone is grappling with these sort of ideologies, it's something that they practice and do more than once. It's not one thing. It happens again and again. It comes up. It's something they fight through over and over. It's a terrible so. thought. Well, I think that it is indicative of finding that in his house. That is a real indicator. But my question for you is that would have been like crazy scary. And as a parent in the early 1900s, mm-hmm. what do you do with that? Like, right. how do you how do you deal with that? There's not a lot of information about 
mental health, especially at that time. Right, exactly. And in fact, the treatment for suicidal ideation in the early 1900s was very, very different from today's approaches. And mental health care was at its infancy. And the well, I just want to say today's approaches are still lacking, I would think, and there's still stigma around this. But to even think like, Today, we're a lot better off is kind of a scary feeling. Go on. Well, one of the most common ways to handle people who had these mental health difficulties, specifically suicidal ideation, was to confine them in asylums and sanitariums. Okay. That's that's horrifying. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And these institutions were intended to isolate them isolate these individuals who exhibited symptoms of mental illness from the rest of society under the guise of providing treatment or protection. And we've done enough research on asylums and been in different places that had sanitariums where a lot of that energy is still trapped just from the traumatic experiences that poor people went through in these places. So, right. I, I mean, mean, if yeah. if I were up against like going into an asylum or trying to keep it on the DL, I would try to keep it on the DL. It's not something that I would be publicizing like I need help with my anxiety. Right. For, well, for sure, for sure. Especially because the treatment in these places was almost medieval. I mean, we're talking about like cold water treatments where they put you in a bath of ice cold water. Why? Like to jolt your system to get you out of your mental health crisis. Like this is what we're talking about. So it wasn't effective real medicine. Do you know what I mean? It's it sounds like they're just slapping them in the face. Like snap out of it. Right, That's what right, that sounds exactly. like. Exactly. And forget about psychotherapy. You know, the idea that you can like talk through your problems. You know, we that's counseling and psychotherapy is understood today as one method of treatment for various mental mental health. But Freud, his stuff didn't come out until, oh, I don't know, it wasn't a big deal until the middle of the 1900s. So that, that idea of talking through your problems to get to the root of it, that wasn't a thing when Tom was alive. Hang in there, guys. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. We are so excited to unveil the first book in our series entitled Common Mystics Present Ghost on the Road, Volume 1, Murders and Mysterious Deaths. It's everything you love about Common Mystics and more. It's a retelling of 10 of our favorite stories from our pod with exciting extras. Extras like souvenirs, what we took away from the experience, and what to know if you go if you decide to travel in our footsteps. Pre-order the Kindle edition now. All other formats of the book will be available for purchase at Amazon.com on July 1st, 2023. Thanks, guys. Now back to the show. So it wasn't until the mid-20th century that the more humane and effective treatments for suicidal ideology or even mental health treatment was available. So we just established that. But let's get back to Tom, okay? We know that there was a terrible accident. Mm -hmm. But do we have any real evidence that suggests that he purposely committed suicide? Well, clues have been revealed in recent years, actually. Like what? Spill the tea. Tell me everything. There is actually some evidence that the Hepburn family was plagued by mental illness crises. They're in good company. (laughs) Since Catherine's passing away in 2003, biographers have uncovered a series of tragic suicides within her family's history. So we obviously know about her brother Tom's death, but there were four other notable instances of this. Catherine's maternal grandfather, Fred Houghton, took his own life in 1892, and that fact was concealed from his grandchildren. Moreover, wow. her great uncle on her mother's side, Charlie Houghton, also died by suicide in 1897. And turning to her father's side, Catherine's uncles, Charlie Hepburn and Dr. Sewell Hepburn, tragically ended their lives in 1915 and 1921, respectively. Yeah. That seems like a lot of suicides in one family. It's like equivalent to the amount of alcoholics in our family. It's like every generation, there are multiple alcoholics. Yeah. And the other troubling thing about this is Catherine and her siblings 
didn't even know because they didn't talk about it. Wow. But what we do know today is that recent research has suggested a genetic link to suicide. The researchers at Mount Sinai collaborated to pinpoint a chromosome variation that, if detected in an individual's DNA, raises the likelihood of future suicide attempts. And this research substantiates the longstanding belief that suicide may be hereditary. So now we will never know whether the Hepburns possessed this chromosome variation, but incidents of suicide were prevalent in their family history. And this information also suggests that Tom may have been genetically predisposed to take his own life. That is fascinating resource. Terrible. Poor Tom didn't know that that's something that he may have to grapple with. Right. But it's so sad and terrible. But why are we giving Tom a voice? Like, what is this about? Why this episode? Well, maybe it's because of how the family dealt with the tragedy of Tom's passing. Okay, I'm here for it. What are you going to tell me? Well, his father, Dr. Hepburn himself, was resolute in his denial that Tom committed suicide. He could never accept it. Mm -hmm. I'm confused by that because you would think Tom knew about his own family history in which that other members of his family had committed suicide. Oh, the doctor? Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, he viewed it as a misguided prank. Wow. mm -hmm, After Tom's death... The New York Times published an article narrating the events from Dr. Hepburn's standpoint. In fact, the entire article is really just a quote, a long explanation from Dr. Hepburn, where he outlines an argument against suicide and an argument that his son's hanging was a prank. The headline was, Says son's hanging was boyish stunt. Dr. Hepburn now believes Lad strangled when rehearsing trick after visit to the movies. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow, wow, wow. First, it's terrible that you have to go to the papers to be like, to set the record straight about su- such a tragedy in your family. Mm-hmm. Second, it feels, uh, it feels very sad. Yeah. It's almost like he's grasping. Mm-hmm. It does. Now, what what I didn't say is immediately after he got news of his son's death, he was asked about it. And he replied, I guess he had a moment of darkness or something to that effect. But there is a quote about him saying, I guess he just had a moment of darkness. And then like a day or two later, he puts out this long statement saying, I was wrong. It wasn't a moment of darkness. I've thought about this and it wasn't suicide. Here's how I know. He had seen this movie. This was something that he used to do with his siblings. He describes how Tom, for, quote, fun, would pretend to hang himself and have his siblings, like, find him and, and, like, laugh. Like, this is, like, the sick game that he kind of describes that doesn't really make any sense. But it's ju- it just doesn't add up for me. It just sounds like this long explanation, like you said, that's grasping straws. Add an explanation, any explanation other than his son taking his own life. Yeah, that's tragic. It's tragic. To be honest, it's tragic that he would even have to address it in such a public way. For real. But it it's embarrassing what he's trying to describe happened. It's like, oh, honey, don't. But there's more. It wasn't just with the public. He also had an interesting way to deal with it within the family. Tell me. Some sources, like the documentary that you and I both saw on Netflix called Call Me Kate, sources indicate that Dr. Hepburn forbade the family to even discuss Tom at all after his death. It was as if they were being forced to erase his memory from their minds like he had never been born at all. That would have made it so difficult for the family to to heal from the tragedy. For sure. But it's also hard to, I mean, if I lost my sibling whom I loved, it would be hard to to honor his short life if I'm not able to talk about the good things that, that he had done. 
if I had to pretend like he wasn't even alive. Right. You couldn't honor his life and you also couldn't heal. How do you heal if you're being forced to not even say his name? You Why know? do you think Dr. Hepburn took that stance, even like in his family? Well, there's a couple theories about this. And one would be that his reluctance to accept or discuss the possibility of Tom's suicide openly might have stemmed because his personal grief was so extensive that he couldn't even go there in his own mind. But another one would have probably been the societal attitudes towards mental health and suicide at the time. I personally feel like it's more of the concern with his family being ridiculed because of the stigma of suicide. That's what I think. Because it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me why, if he was so grief stricken, it would be like in the family, we don't talk about Tom anymore. That doesn't make sense to me. If it was like his own personal grief. Well, think about it this way. Suicide was actually illegal at the time in many places. And if you attempted to commit suicide, you could face criminal charges. Mm, also, that's weird. Uh huh. Families of individuals who died by suicide often faced social ostracization. Yeah. They're already being ostracized. They're already being ostracized. This is just another another thing for people to lash on to. But go on. Right. But the stigma surrounding suicide may have been served as a deterrent, but it led people to not want to talk about it in public and discuss it, which gave no one the opportunity who was struggling with those ideologies to get any kind of help. Because if you're like, man, I'm anxious, I'm thinking about suicide, I'd be like, in prison with you. Right. Like, what the fuck? Like, right. I, would, I wouldn't talk about it. Right. And over the decades, there has been a shift towards understanding suicide as a public health issue rather than a moral failing. Because a lot of these rules and laws against suicide have to do with church doctrine. How annoying. Everything, yeah. like everything goes back to moral deficiencies. It's like, oh my God, I'm exhausted with you people. Tell me. Well, tell over me. the years, this change is reflected in the decriminalization in many countries and the growing recognition of the importance of mental health services. And recent research has contributed to better understanding of the factors that contribute to suicide and highlight the need for intervention, right? Mm -hmm. And by the late 20th and early 21st centuries, there is an increasing emphasis on the role of societal factors in suicide. So it's not necessarily the fault of the individual who's suffering. Studies are starting to explore how social pressures, economic stress, and isolation influence individual vulnerabilities to suicide. And this perspective can lead to a more nuanced understanding of suicide, recognizing the complex interplay between personal, psychological, and societal factors. And so efforts overall to reduce suicide have shifted in the modern day, towards changing public knowledge and attitudes and aiming to reduce the stigma and increase support for those affected by suicide. There was an issue in London. Did I tell you about this before? I don't where think so. housewives were committing suicide because of the type of ovens that they had made it easy for them to gas themselves to death. Oh my God. And part of the discussion was, well, we should get rid of these these ovens that are doing this. And people in, in England were like, wait a second, if it's just getting rid of the ovens, they're going to find different ways to commit suicide if that's what they're going to do. But studies after they, they outlawed the oven suggested that if you put up barriers between the opportunity and the accessibility to harm yourself, it makes people second guess their decision. Whereas if it's so available, like a gun or an oven that gases, mm. that you would have, it, it would just be like a snap decision. So p creating barriers would help someone to either de-escalate the situation or make it harder for them to actually commit suicide. Just saying. Just thought that was interesting. Hmm. There's still a stigma today, of course. For sure. And attitudes towards suicide can vary widely depending on your cultural, religious, and generational factors. And obviously, we're not completely there. There are ongoing efforts that are still needed to address challenges and disparities that still exist. 
as a spiritual standpoint, I just want to say suicide is just like hitting the reset button. I don't want to do this again. You know what I'm saying? Like, in other words, sure fire away. You're not going to be sent to hell, is what you're saying. Like, you're that. not going to be sent to hell, but you're going to be back down here doing the same shit over and over again. So don't hit the reset. Just go through it once. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, that's what we believe, and I think that's a really good point. Like, There's, if this is bad, yeah. if if the bad stuff already happened to you, like, I don't want to do it again. Like, let's just move forward from here. I don't want that to be my last experience on Earth. Right. And I think you and I both come from the standpoint that the challenges that are put in front of us are put in front of us for a reason. And that reason is to learn something, right? Mm-hmm. And- Obviously, I, we have choices, and and we respond to choices. And I, I just want to say that I like I do suffer from anxiety and depression. Like honestly, I do. But I feel like I'm very lucky in the fact that I am bold enough to have those conversations with like mom and you. And like, if I'm having a bad day, I can like call Ryan and be like, "I'm eating the whole jar of peanut butter, and you're not going to stop me." Whereas I, what I find troubling is so many people that may have these conditions or these thoughts that they keep it to themselves and they isolate themselves. And that to me makes me sad. And I want people to know that there is a life, like those, those pressures are real, but there is a life beyond those. And those moments are though they are, they're intense, but they also go away. That don't let those moments be the last ones on earth because there are better times to come. And if you're listening and you have thoughts of suicide, don't stay isolated. Don't keep them to yourself. Please call or text 988, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Their hours are 24-7 and the cost is free. So maybe if you or someone else listening needs to hear this, please send this message out there if you are considering suicide. But for Tom, there was no such resource for him. Mm -mm. Do you think that he intended to end his life? Honestly, I do. A hundred percent, I do too. I don't think he was acting out a scene from a movie and I don't think he was acting out a stunt. I think in that moment, he was depressed and he did commit suicide. That's what I feel. I feel the same way. And I feel like, I feel like his, whatever he was going through mentally just got the better of him that day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just hard to keep fighting. And maybe he didn't want to go home. Maybe like there was something going on at home. The fact that he was on the suitcase <sighs> makes, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Like he was like, I don't want to go back there. I can understand that. <laughs> Just saying, as a kid with no having to rely on your parents and not having those choices, maybe he was like, yeah, I don't want to do that again. You know, you and I had a conversation about Tom because we we grew up scrappy. We had nothing. We were really poor. And we always assumed, I'll speak for myself, I always assumed that if we only had money, you know what I mean? Like all of our problems would be solved. Mm -hmm. But here you have Tom who comes from a well-to-do family, but I still feel for Tom. You know what I mean? Like maybe my view that money money is the is the cure to everything. And if you have money, what are you complaining about? You know what I mean? Because he well, had pressures on him too. I think that's what I was grappling with in the cemetery. Because my first thought was, wh what the hell does this privileged, yeah. good-looking, talented boy <laughs> Popular, have to, uh, smart- po why? Like, like, what do you have to be sad about, Tom? So sad that you're going to kill yourself. And it was literally that, that like, disdain that I had. Like, really? You had a hard time? And then I turned around and was walking back to the car, and I felt this, like, pain in my gut. Mm. And I knew it was, like, information dropped on me like a, like an anvil in a cartoon. It was like, yeah, that's a lot to live up to. Mm. Like the fact that I'm supposed to be grateful, the fact that the, uh, it looks real nice, doesn't it? Like that's a lot. Oh, and wow. I, in that moment, I felt like sick and I was like, okay, I get it. 
Like sometimes like my mouth like <laughs> like overrides and then the spirits are like, nah, bitch, you wrong. And here you go. And I'm like, oh, that was that moment for me. So I get it. Like there's something in his life that although it seemed pristine, he did not want to deal with. And that kind of pressure when you already start from a place of privilege to keep it there, yeah. I will never understand that. Even the quote from his father about how, of course, he's going to go to John Hopkins where I went and get his medical degree. Do you know what I mean? Like the expectation that he was going to carry on this great work that his unusual, extraordinary parents began, you know, that he right. was going to take this torch and move on with it. Maybe maybe that's not what he wanted with his life. Yeah. But maybe it was, it, it, it's, it was, you know, a different kind of cage for him, a gilded cage, but nonetheless a cage that he couldn't break free from. So I, I left this story maybe reconsidering my own narrow and unfair view of maybe people who are born in privilege, because maybe it's not what I imagine it to be. Do you know what I mean? A hundred percent. And I think that that's really, that's a growth moment for us. Yeah. So bad on us. But also I do want to say that although she was unable to talk about Tom or express her love for Tom, I do think that his short life and his death did influence the way Kate went through her life and navigated the choices she made. Because she went about it fearlessly. Like she had zero fucks. She did. And she also, did you know this? She celebrated Tom's birthday as her own for her entire <gasps> oh. life. Yeah. I did not. Yes. So she celebrated her birthday as her brother's so that every year she would remember him and commemorate him. Yeah. I want to cry. So Stop it. That was a quiet way for her never to forget her brother, mm -hmm. uh, even though she right wasn't able thought, to talk about him. Right when I thought I couldn't love her more. <laughs> Stop it. So Tom's okay. voice clearly comes through. And I think we've discussed how, that, how it came through to us and why. But there's another voice that came through to us too, Jill. I, I love this part. And that was his father, Dr. Hepburn. Now, Dr. Hepburn was publicly criticized for his progressive beliefs. We've already mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So have you asked yourself how this public criticism might have affected his ability to admit that his son died as a result of a mental health crisis? Think about it. We already yeah. know. We already know how society views suicide, right? With stigma and with ostracism for the family. Right. And his critics might have said that it was his liberal views or both parents' liberal views that in some way resulted in his son's sick thinking, right? That's completely fucked up. And maybe, just maybe, just maybe, if he admitted that his son committed suicide, maybe his good works in the community would have been thwarted if he publicly admitted it. Do you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying, but I still think he's a prick because of the way he treated his family in regards to Tom's death. That I get all that. Like, okay. I just privately, don't want to gloss over the public pressure that that would have caused. I got it. I totally get and it. And by silencing his children, his six children, he was probably taking control of what they talk about and what they don't talk about, not only inside, but outside the family. Because that's how a lot of families were. Like, you just don't talk about some things. Okay. Touche. Okay. Because we mm -hmm. didn't talk about... Yeah, yeah I get it. I, I get see it. what you did you there. It. I see what you did there. <laughs> but we still talked about it with each other. Yeah. So that's the difference. I Although see. we knew not to talk about magic and spirits and dead people when we were in public, when we were alone and together, it was a safe place to experiment and have fun with it. Hence, look how we developed this podcast. That's so true. whatever. That's true. I just I just don't want everyone to have just this only negative feelings about Dr. Hepburn because he was an extraordinary man and he was a wonderful parent. And Catherine later in life always said that she had two extraordinary parents. And people who were close to Catherine also said that after Tom's suicide, she and her father actually got closer. So even though he didn't let his family talk about suicide and he publicly, publicly denounced that his son committed suicide, there must have been something good about him because Catherine got closer to him after the event and didn't resent him. I think that people are complex mm. and they don't have to always make sense. But 
I understand what you're saying. Okay. I hear you. But I still want to be mad at Dr. <laughs> okay. Hepburn for time. That's safe. That, for that's time. safe. That, yeah. that, that, that's fair. Let you me can... be his wingman. You know what I mean? Let me be mad for him because he couldn't. But Jill, we still feel that Dr. Hepburn still doesn't want the world to know that his son committed suicide. That's true. And this is my favorite part. And I'm so glad we finally got here. Please, why do we believe this? Well, we have some particular evidence that supports this. Tell the people. So we had left the cemetery at Hartford, Connecticut, and we were on our way somewhere in Rhode Island. I believe it was Foster, Rhode Island. Was it not, Jill? It was. It was Foster, Rhode Island. And we were in the car and we were texting with friends who were following us, who were following our location. So they knew that we were in New England and we were texting them some photographs that we had taken. Shout out to our girls, (laughs) Emily and Kirsten. Hey, girls. Hey. Hey, girls. Hey. Anyway, so we're on a text, a group text, you, me, Emily, Kirsten, and you send them photographs of Catherine Hepburn's grave and also Thomas's grave. And you send those, and then you don't explain why you sent Thomas's grave. And so I'm on the strand too, and I'm thinking, well, that's that's going to confuse them because they don't know any of the background on Thomas and they don't know why you're sending this picture. So I start to explain that Tom Hepburn was Catherine's brother who killed himself And I'm texting this, and as I'm texting, killed himself, my phone freezes. My phone freezes, and I'm still trying to text, but it's not responding to my finger. And so I'm like, what is happening with my phone? Am I going to have to do like a hard restart? And then as I'm looking at it, it unfreezes, and I'm watching the letters that I just typed Tom killed himself, are being erased systematically, one letter at a time, backwards through my text, until the entire text is erased. And then I have access to my phone back. And it's acting normal. And it's acting completely normally. Now, I will say this. There have been times when I've been texting where you accidentally select all and then accidentally like delete an entire thing that you had just Mm -hmm. texted. But I've never, ever in my life had an experience where my phone stopped responding and then started deleting one letter at a time backwards systematically. That has never happened before or since. And I think that was spirit. I think that was spirit too. Whose spirit? I think think that was the spirit of Dr. Hepburn. Because he does not want the word that Thomas committed suicide out in the world. He's still holding on to that stigma, even today. I believe you're totally right. But I do want to say that there's something about Foster, Rhode Island, that is special in a way like the veil there is thinner. Mm. And I feel like us being in Foster, Rhode Island amplified Dr. Hepburn's ability to take control of your phone. Ooh, interesting. And so are we going to have more stories about Foster, Rhode Island in the next few weeks? Yes, ma'am. You know it. Well, I cannot wait. (laughs) Thank you guys so much for listening. That brings us to the end of tonight's broadcast. (laughs) So please check out our website, commonmystics.net. Follow us on our socials at Common Mystics Pod. Please listen in wherever you're listening to your favorite pods. And please consider leaving us a positive review. We love reading them and sharing them. Yes, please. And also subscribe, download, 